All right, well, hi everybody. It is 12 o'clock central time, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you all to the University of Illinois Chicago College of Nursing Midwest Nursing History Research Center Fall Speaker Series. Um, just this is the first time we're doing it completely remotely. So just a couple ground rules. Um, please make sure that you are muted during the presentation. Um, we don't want any background noise to kind of interrupt the feed from our presenter. Um, at the end of um, Dr. Mathias' presentation, we will have some time for questions. Um, I ask that you use the chat feature for questions just so that we're not talking over each other um, and we miss questions. And I will um, moderate the chat and will ask questions on your behalf for uh, Dr. Mathias. Um, I also wanted to give you all some information about our History Center. Um, and some opportunities for you to be more involved if you're interested. Um, we do do a Nursing History Center book club every semester um, that we do have Zoom capable. So um, if you're interested in joining that, this semester we're reading The Wonderful Adventures of Mrs. Sequel by Mary Sequel, which is her autobiography about um, her career. And um, I also, if you are interested in that, you can send me an email. Um, I'll put my email in the chat, but it's my first name, Gwyneth, G-W-Y-N-E-T-H, at uic.edu. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we do have uh, funding through our Center for Nursing History Research, um, which Dr. Mathias was a past recipient of, um, and that funding sponsors a historical researcher to come to Chicago and access our archives and other archives here in Chicago for a research project. Um, those applications are due in the spring, um, and you can find out more information about that on our website, which I will put a link to in the chat as well. Um, and, or you can send me an email if you have questions. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our speaker today. So Dr. April Mathias is an associate professor and the program coordinator for the Master of Science in Nursing Nurse Educator Program at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. She earned her bachelor's degree in nursing from Waynesburg State, or sorry, Waynesburg University, her master's degree in nursing education from Duke University, and her PhD in nursing from East Carolina University. She is a certified nurse educator with the National League for Nursing and has been a nurse educator for 20 years. Dr. Mathias's program of research focuses on the professional identity and role development of the nurse through various pedagogies and educational pathways. Her nursing history research has included study of early diploma, baccalaureate, accelerated baccalaureate, and associate degree programs. Today, she is presenting her most recent study of early 20th century nursing correspondence courses, the earliest form of distance education for nursing. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mathias. Thank you everybody and thank you Dr. Milbrath. The global COVID-19 pandemic and the social distancing mandate that followed has forced academic institutions to deliver curriculum in the online environment. Fully online teaching and learning, a form of distance education is a delivery model not traditionally employed by entry-level nursing programs. However, educators had to adapt courses for this model to continue preparing nurses during the pandemic. Although this pivot to fully online entry-level nursing curriculum felt new, entry-level nursing education via distance education first occurred more than 100 years ago. At the turn of the 20th century, Correspondence courses, the earliest form of distance education, were developed to prepare trained nurses through printed course materials sent through the mail. This presentation will focus on a prominent correspondence course for nursing and its unconventional pedagogical approach. Due to the large number of students attending the presentation today, I would like to honor the uniqueness of the correspondence courses unconventional approach and introduce my work in an unconventional way. I ask that the nursing history scholars in attendance extend patience as I explain how I arrived to this place with this specific nursing history research study. 
it'll provide somewhat of a digital story within this virtual presentation and also to explain research decisions. I first learned about correspondence courses in nursing in the fall of 2017 at the American Association for the History of Nursing Annual Conference, where I met Ann Oboisky, who introduced me to the Chautauqua School of Nursing correspondence course. I asked her many questions for I had never heard of this school before. Dr. Bridget Lusk overheard my conversation and shared with me that the Midwest Nursing History Research Center housed artifacts for Chautauqua and for another correspondence course, the Chicago School of Nursing. After the conference, I began to search for more information on these schools. I realized that correspondence courses receive minimal to no mention in nursing history narratives, and almost every mention was negative because correspondence courses did not require practical training or what we refer to today as clinical experiences. In 2004, the Chautauqua School of Nursing correspondence course was reviewed more positively as an innovative distance education approach. The most comprehensive account of Chautauqua is Oboisky's 2006 master's thesis, where she primarily describes the establishment, operation, and closure of the school, and only briefly comments on its educational quality. A comprehensive evaluation of the school's educational quality to prepare their graduates for nursing practice in the early 20th century was lacking. I applied for funding to complete such an evaluation. I am grateful for the support of the Karen and Terrence Home Visiting Scholar Award and the American Association for the History of Nursing H15 grant that funded my travel to the archives displayed. Archive research led me to discover that the Chautauqua and Chicago schools were very similar. I selected the Chautauqua School of Nursing to serve as an exemplar for my analysis for three main reasons. One, the school's administrative location in New York, where during the time of Chautauqua was the mecca of organized nurse leaders nursing education reform efforts, as well as the location of nursing education innovation from one of the first American Nightingale Model Training Schools at Bellevue Hospital Training School for Nurses to the collegiate level education for trained nurses offered at Teachers College. And two, Chautauqua's proclaimed reach in its 34 year tenure, enrolling tens of thousands of students across America and across the globe. And number three, quite merely, the amount of extant artifacts for Chautauqua. Primary source artifacts mainly include the course's written lectures and supplemental educational resources, student testimony booklets, correspondence letters between the students and school, written examinations, school advertisements and magazines and newspapers, reports and addresses from nursing organizations and leaders, and nursing textbooks and journal articles of that time period. I also read and reviewed secondary sources, such as those displayed, to validate, enhance, and confirm findings, and to inform the historical context of nursing education and practice of that time period. In this presentation, I will argue that Chautauqua developed in their motivated students a professional nurse identity and prepared them for the private duty nurse role in the early 20th century. Chautauqua's supportive community and pedagogical approach that included written theoretical and practical instruction, written examinations, and student selected practical experiences, although unconventional, held value and deserve space in the nursing education history narrative. Chautauqua School of Nursing was established and incorporated as a business, not a school, in 1902. At the time of its inception, there were extreme inconsistencies in the preparation of the trained nurse within the many hospital schools. 
As noted by Isabel Hampton Robb at the turn of the 20th century in her addresses on educational standards for nurses, organized nursing, the nurse superintendents of the larger hospital schools, recognize the inconsistencies and deficiencies and diligently discuss ways to protect the title nurse, professionalize nursing practice with standardization of nurse training and nurse registration. Rob emphasized the need for a standardized curriculum and repeatedly noted the hospital as the ideal location for practical training. For within the appropriate hospitals, students will not only gain the needed practical experiences, but these experiences will build in the student the character required to be a nurse. Patricia D'Antonio in her book, American Nursing, explains the nurse leader's recognition of the hospital training school's moral responsibility to build the student's character through practical training into that of a nurse who can practice nursing with good judgment. Nursing believed that education alone without practical training could not promise the character of a graduate. It's also important to remember that hospitals establish training schools with the primary purpose to acquire well-disciplined, manageable women to provide patient care. The education a student received was mainly the product of the many hours of nurse supervised patient care and the hospital work required. D'Antonio argues in American Nursing that women were, quote, willing to trade their work for meaningful, respected, and authoritative medical knowledge, end quote. Students graduated from Chautauqua after successful completion of two courses, studies in general nursing and obstetrical and surgical nursing. There were a total of 47 written lectures that included theoretical and practical instruction. Five specifically focused on anatomy and physiology and six on dietetics. The course also included supplemental resources to include directions for study, nurses' bedside stories, letters from the principal sharing a physician's viewpoint, and guidelines for the supplemental, yet not required, physician-supervised practical experiences. Practical experiences were the responsibility of the student, but the school did provide students letters of support so they could share with physicians to secure such experiences. The lectures were mailed to students in increments, and if the student completed one lecture per week as anticipated, the total length of study would be approximately one year. Students received one written examination at a time. These were returned to Chautauqua, corrected by hand, and then returned back to the student. There were a total of 44 written examinations. Tuition was approximately $75, depending on the payment plan that was selected. Such was the framework in which students learned how to prepare and maintain a sick room, provide nursing care to, to diverse patients with various conditions, interact with physicians, and communicate with and teach patients and families. Chautauqua students initially received a Directions for Study booklet, where the purpose of the course to train women in the theory and practice of nursing is the opening sentence. The directions were provided to assist the student in becoming an expert and well-trained nurse. It introduces the student to the curriculum and how they will be evaluated, and explains the academic efforts expected of the student and the support that students can expect from the school. This booklet provides insight on the supportive community the school created for the students. In the booklet, they introduce the student to the study helps that are integrated in each lecture. These include outlines for study of the lecture, study questions, and directions for home practice. Chautauqua students are reminded that there are two distinct features of the course, theoretical and 
practical. It is plainly noted that the practical portions are of greatest importance, and this is emphasized repeatedly through the lectures to continually motivate the students to practice. Chautauqua also provided the student a six-step plan for the study of each lecture. Repeated review, attention to illustrations, precise practice of skills, outlining or taking notes of the material, and practice testing were highlights of the steps, ending with instructions to contact the school if confusion on any topic persisted. The student is encouraged that the content in the lectures builds in a manner that they will become increasingly familiar with medical knowledge and that they will refer and that they can refer back to their lectures rather than need to memorize all content. They, they assure the student that as the course progresses, they will find their ability to retain the essential points of the lectures more easily. In the directions for study booklet, Chautauqua introduces the student to the bedside stories from a diary of a nurse as a supplemental educational resource. These 61 stories are described as actual experiences in nursing written by graduate Chautauqua nurses. The stories are intended to provide a narrative of the practical application of principles studied in the course. Knowing these stories were written by graduates provides the student hope for successful completion and evidence of the Chautauqua nurses finding work as a nurse. Chautauqua also notifies the student they may receive letters from the principal physician or the secretary with individual instruction, encouragement, or in response to students' specific concerns or questions. Students are encouraged to send questions related to the lectures or anything, quote, in connection with nursing, and they will be answered in writing. According to the students' testimonies that I read, the students complied and felt that the communication through personal letters helped them feel connected with the school, creating a sense of community. Compliments of the school and specifically the secretary, Mr. William Bailey, filled the testimonies. Students shared their sincere appreciation for the personal interest the school showed for their success. Students described responses as kind, encouraging, thorough, and prompt. This supportive collegial atmosphere was a stark difference from the rigid discipline students experienced in the hospital training schools, where students, as explained by Susan Reverby in her book, Ordered to Care, were discouraged to ask questions to better understand rationale for medical or nursing care. The disciplinary atmosphere in the hospital was created as a means to maintain order and to ensure completion of hospital work. Nurse superintendents had to balance hospital demands with the educational needs of the students and often needed to act in the role of administrator rather than educator. The education of the Chautauqua student was the school's priority, and despite the physical distance between the school and the students, the school engaged with the students on a personal level, and the students felt like they received individualized instruction. Students are also informed in the Directions for Study booklet that written answers to the examination questions are required and serve as the basis for being awarded a certificate of graduation. Chautauqua does not indicate a required minimum passing score for the examinations. In an early lecture, the school defends the evaluation of students through the written examination, claiming the written responses are deliberate statements and provide them a more intimate acquaintance with the student's progress than any oral questioning could obtain. Furthermore, the anecdotal communication that accompanied corrected examinations also served as an additional as additional instruction or in some instances, corrective feedback. For example, Ms. Myra 
Arntz was an enrolled student in 1912. Her exam is on the screen and she received a two month trial scholarship. She sent a personal note with her completed symptoms of disease examination, noting that her husband had been ill and to practice her skills, she took his temperature, pulse and respirations often. She noted his respirations as Shane Stokes breathing while he was asleep and requested medical advice for his care. The school replied with instructions for him to seek medical care if he is not well, but also corrected her assessment and redirected her understanding of the respiratory assessment finding. This serves as an example of how the absence of practical experience may have contributed to the student's misunderstanding of the written lecture, but also serves as an example of how the open and encouraged communication between the school and students provided a teachable moment. Despite Chautauqua's confidence in their plan of study that they shared in the Directions for Study booklet, the introduction to their first lecture serves to defend the correspondence course as preparation for nursing practice. Although the school clearly communicates that nursing requires theoretical knowledge and practical expertise, theoretical knowledge is what the course best provides the student, and it is up to the student to gain the practical experience. The deficiency of theoretical learning in the hospital training schools is the basis of Chautauqua's argument. Chautauqua simply notes that a correspondence course, despite its defects, has advantages. advantages. A major advantage is the meticulously written lectures at an appropriate level for the nurse in place of the hospital training school's imperfectly prepared, noted and remembered oral lectures by physicians that are typically above the needed knowledge level of the nurse. Students agreed for compliments of the lectures filled the testimony booklets. Students described the lectures as clearly written in plain language, thorough yet concise, and filled with practical, valuable information. The clearly distinct sections of each lecture were praised for making the content easy to study. The ability to take the lecture booklets with them on the go study the lecture sections in short increments of time and stay focused because the lectures were interesting, made intermittent study time effective. Students describe the lectures to be worth two to 10 times the cost and explain that they would not part with the lectures for any amount of money. Chautauqua also notes the lack of demonstrations as a major disadvantage of the correspondence course and one that may pose difficulty for the student. However, they also described these three strategies displayed that they employed to overcome this difficulty. Student testimonies explained that the pictures and illustrations within the lectures made learning skills easy. Although the hospital training schools offered such demonstrations, the student's exposure to hospital nursing care was often less about learning skills and more about completing repetitive hospital work. Immediately in this first lecture, Chautauqua students are inundated with talking points to defend the school's pedagogical approach and thus their educational pathway choice. Before arming the student with any medical or scientific knowledge, Chautauqua uses these first two lectures to share their perspective of the ideal nurse and the role of the nurse in the management of the sick room. This lays a foundation for development of the student's professional nurse identity and role in patient care alongside the physician. Throughout the first lecture, they seesaw between highlighting the authority and power of the nurse for effective patient care with reminders that the nurse must be subordinate, obedient, and loyal to the physician and medical profession.
They refer to nursing as a profession and the nurse as a professional whose two basic qualifications include conscientiousness and the power of observation. Conscientiousness, as described by Chautauqua, is the art of nursing, knowing what to do and how best to do it. They're the professional responsibility of the nurse is to care for the patient and the sick room through selflessness, with empathy, tact, and good judgment, and to be, quote, a complete master of hygienic measures, while also radiating hope and inspiring confidence. Students are instructed that the nurse should never question, offer suggestions to, or criticize the physician, thus to remain loyal. The theme of loyalty to the physician, regardless of situation, continues throughout the lectures. This aligns with the hierarchical culture in the hospital training schools. The disadvantage for the Chautauqua student rested in only being able to read about this culture from a physician's perspective and through nurses' narrative accounts of patient cases and not having the opportunity to observe nurses navigate the hierarchical medical structure for the benefit of the patient. The second qualification, the power of observation, is described as one that can be developed. The student is encouraged to begin immediately to be a nurse and to develop keen observation skills, and that over time, what they are observing will make sense as they learn what the observations mean related to various illnesses and conditions. Chautauqua's second lecture outlines fundamental principles of nursing. This lecture contains numerous photographs and illustrations and introduces the students to their first practical instruction with practice exercises, where they list the skills students need to practice and outline how best to carry them out. They encourage repetition for mastery and to continue to practice throughout the entire two courses to maintain mastery. The principles taught in this early lecture are applied to various patient conditions and nursing care throughout the two courses. My study of the Chautauqua lectures noted repetition of nursing care principles and notations throughout the lectures, pointing students backward and forward to other content, helping the students make connections across content. Depth of content and rationale increased as lectures progressed through the courses. The content progressed from simple to complex and normal to abnormal within a lecture and across lectures. The school provides the student encouragement and confidence that they will strengthen their mind over time and if they do their best, success will occur. This aligns with Chautauqua's motto, I will conquers and I may fails. Analysis of the accuracy and adequacy of the content within Chautauqua's courses was completed using typhoid fever as the content exemplar because a patient's recovery from typhoid fever was largely dependent on the nurse's intelligent and skilled care of the patient. I compared the typhoid fever content in Chautauqua's Fever Nursing Typhoid Fever Lecture to that published in two nursing textbooks and many articles from the American Nursing Journal. The comparison showed that Chautauqua provided the same nursing care instructions with the same underlining nursing care principles. And at times, the explanations were more detailed and comprehensive. Therefore, Chautauqua provided an accurate and more than adequate curriculum related to care of a typhoid fever patient with appropriate and thorough presentation of relevant medical and nursing content. Additionally, the fact that there were bedside stories related to typhoid fever in both the courses demonstrates the integration and progression of content within the curriculum. 
Chautauqua's use of illustrations, photographs, practice questions, and the bedside stories served as adequate resources for students to gain the needed theoretical and practical knowledge to guide their care of a patient with typhoid fever, specifically in the home setting. Student testimonies highlighted the systematic training within the courses and explain that the content in the lectures help them to build a solid nursing knowledge base. Students often wrote about how the lectures not only taught them what and how to do things, but why to do them. They noted this depth of knowledge increased their confidence and competence to take on any patient case, whether medical, surgical, obstetrical, pediatric, or contagious, and to communicate intelligently with physicians. In 1916, the 22nd Annual Report of the National League of Nursing Education noted the use of textbooks as an important instrument in the process of education. The report outlined that the textbook must be organized, accurate, and well-written, and inclusive of illustrations, diagrams, or drawings. Chautauqua's lectures included these quality elements. However, the report also emphasized that the textbook is only effective when accompanied by the influence of a good teacher who can correlate the textbook theory with practical experience. Chautauqua's pedagogical approach lack the influence of nurse educators on the student's practical application. Not one nurse was identified within Chautauqua's administrative or staff positions in their yearbook. Chautauqua students' appreciation of the written lectures and the theoretical and practical knowledge gained clashes with organized nursing's belief that education alone could prepare a student for the trained nurse role. It also clashes with the American Medical Association, who reported in 1905 and again in 1913 within their journal that nursing cannot be taught through th theoretical instruction in written text. The American Medical Association emphasized that nurses needed the quote, main thing of practical training for the nurse to not be quote, a disappointment to themselves, an irritation to physicians, and a danger to the public, end quote. So let's discuss that main thing of practical training, because Chautauqua not requiring it served as a major reason for the opposition it occurred. Hospital work, serving as the nursing students' practical training in the hospital training schools was flawed. Often it was under-supervised and not coordinated with theoretical instruction. However, as D'Antonio explains in American Nursing, nurses were able to exercise some control over the practical training. This was the only control nurses held with regard to educating nurses in the hospitals. Physicians controlled the medical content shared in their oral lectures, but the nurse superintendents controlled the students' daily hospital work, where they were able to supervise the students' application of medical content and development of skilled nursing techniques. This reality emphasized the significance of the nurse-supervised practical training that organized nursing insisted on for preparation of the trained nurse. Chautauqua encouraged physician-supervised practical training, but did not require it, and they did not encourage or require nurse-supervised practical training for their students. Their lack of required practical training fueled the fight against correspondence courses. However, many Chautauqua students did seek and gain practical experiences. The majority of the students whose testimonies I read in those three booklets worked in the role of a private duty nurse while they were a student. Many noted working as a nurse before enrolling, the desire to learn more, become more skilled, and thus 
earn more prompted them to enroll. Others began working in the role of a nurse at different times while they were enrolled. The variances in when students sought practical experience aligns with the school recommending such experience after securing a foundation of nursing knowledge through the lectures. This varied based on the students' previous experiences and confidence in their nursing knowledge. Because Chautauqua did not require practical training, it was also acceptable for students to complete both courses before beginning to work in the role of a nurse. Unlike the hospital training school's graduates who had to transition from hospital nursing care to private duty nursing care, Chautauqua students learned in the environment where they would work. As physicians, patients and families express satisfaction with their care, the students gain confidence, propelling them to continue their studies. The ability to carry the lectures related to the patient's condition to the case to use as a resource or reference was also a major benefit expressed by the students. Students use moments of time when the patient was resting to review old and study new lectures. This allowed students to coordinate theoretical learning with their practical experiences, an advantage not typically available in the training schools. The Chautauqua students recognize the need and value of practical experiences to enrich their learning and to improve their competence. The ability to earn money while gaining practical experience was an advantage most hospital training schools could not provide and was invaluable for the Chautauqua students with homes and families to support. Several students noted that working patient cases paid for the cost of the course and supported their living while learning. Students shared they were able to charge up to two times more as they progressed through the course. Along with higher wages, they also experienced consistent work. Many noted that they did not need to seek work because cases were offered to the point they often had to refuse them. Students had boundless opportunities for practical experience with such consistent work. A few mentioned the high demand for nurses in their community to provide quality care to their patients in their home. Chautauqua students provided a valuable and much needed service in their home communities while they were learning. Most of the Chautauqua students did obtain practical experiences under the supervision of a physician during or after the courses. This demonstrates that physicians did acknowledge the correspondence course as a viable option to become a private duty nurse, contrary to the American Medical Association's proclamation that no physician would seek the aid of a correspondence course graduate. Chautauqua's sequence of theoretical instruction followed by practical application mirrors medical education prior to the 20th century and mirrors nursing education in the later 20th century. The greater issue was lack of nursing influence, control, and supervision over such experiences. The robustness of Chautauqua's lectures, both in length and content, within the anticipated one-week timeline for completion, coupled with the students' isolation studying at home and Chautauqua not requiring practical training, required a discipline driven student who possessed strong reading and writing skills and the initiative to practice and obtain experience. So let's take a closer look at who was a Chautauqua student. I read 189 testimonies and testimonies from physicians, patients, and employers praising the work of 28 additional students. Within the 189 testimonies, some demographic information was voluntarily shared. Because the same demographic information was not provided in every testimony, the actual figures may be greater. As you can see on the graph, several of these students were non-traditional. 
hospital schools required students to be young, single, and female during this time. 44 students mentioned a desire to enroll in a hospital training school, and 15 of the students did attend one for a brief while. These students were unable to enroll or stay enrolled due to family responsibilities or their own health or physical fitness. Four of the students were graduates of a hospital training school and desired to gain theoretical knowledge to improve their nursing care. The strict admission requirements, the grueling work required of hospital training school students, and the insufficient theoretical instruction within the hospital training schools were evidently reasons some of these students selected Chautauqua. The 216 students named in the three booklets were from 37 of the American states or territories, Washington, D.C., and from France, Mexico, and Canada. The demographics of just this small sample of Chautauqua students illustrate not only a non-traditional nursing student population, but illustrate that Chautauqua was able to cast a wide net for this educational opportunity. Geographical location of the larger urban hospitals with excellent training schools also served as a deterrent and led students to Chautauqua. The repetitive use of specific language across the student testimonies brings to question the specificity of the prompts used by the school in their request. However, the spirit of empowerment and learning that comes through the testimonies is remarkable. Personal stories of desperate times and loss of hope were improved with newfound independence and confidence. Chautauqua provided an opportunity to learn a valuable and practical skill, as well as to understand the theory and rationale behind the skill. This combination made the students work meaningful and fulfilling and ensured they provided effective and quality care for their patients. This led to their opportunity to secure consistent work, earn a living, and independently care for themselves and loved ones. And finally, this led to an opportunity to feel useful, confident, and competent as a contributing member to their family or community. These same benefits were sought and secured by nurses who graduated from the hospital training schools. Aligning with both Reverby and D'Antonio's research of early 20th century American nursing, the correspondence courses provided its students through a supportive community and unconventional pedagogical approach, the same result of the hospital training schools and what they provided for their students. The students were empowered as nurses through knowledge, meaningful work, a sense of accomplishment, and a group identity. Although the Chautauqua students' practical experiences did not fit the mold of organized nursing's nurse supervised practical training in the hospital. The student selected patient cases coupled with the meticulous theoretical and practical instruction within the lectures were successful in preparing the students to work as a nurse in private duty during this time. The self-determined practical experiences and self-paced home study opened a profitable career in nursing for many motivated individuals who otherwise could not enroll in a hospital training school. Chautauqua improved nursing care within families and communities by arming the students with a strong theoretical foundation for their nursing care techniques. Gratitude towards Chautauqua and their support was echoed throughout the testimonies and the themes of increased knowledge, improved skill, enhanced earning power, independence, increased confidence, competence, and consistent work weave a tapestry of opportunity with strong threads for the Chautauqua School of Nursing graduates. In the early 20th century, nursing students traded work within the rigid discipline of hospital training schools to gain a nurse identity, authority associated with medical knowledge, and meaningful work. Chautauqua students exchanged tuition 
and self-discipline for these same outcomes. Because Chautauqua did not depend on the hospital or nurses to train their students, Chautauqua was a threat to the dysfunctional juxtaposition of hospital work and nursing education that organized nursing delicately balanced. Adding in the resistance organized nursing incurred from the smaller hospitals, nurse superintendents and graduates who fought to hold on to their school and nurse identity, organized nursing had enough to manage to achieve their goals. Organized nursing did not need the correspondence course as another challenge in their fight to standardize nursing education, protect the title nurse, and professionalize nursing practice through registration. Opposing the correspondence course and holding firm to the need for nurse supervised practical training in the hospital where nurses exercise some control over nursing education appeared to be organized nursing's best strategy. But was it? Correspondence courses such as Chautauqua possess the structured, organized, and appropriate theoretical curriculum for nursing practice that organized nursing desired. Hospital training schools possess the nurse educators and the nurse supervised practical experiences that Chautauqua did not include in their pedagogical approach. The strength of one aligned with the deficiency of the other. Collaboration may have been a missed opportunity for organized nursing to achieve standardization of nurse training and for the correspondence course to achieve sustainability. At the turn of the 20th century, Isabel Hampton Robb repeatedly called for the adoption of a spirit of unity to establish standards and facilitate affiliations between schools and hospitals to ensure adequate training for all nurses. She also advocated for the establishment of a central institute that would offer comprehensive theoretical and practical training in general nursing. The institute would be independent of any particular hospital, but would utilize appropriate hospitals for rotation of nurse supervised practical training. Chautauqua shared a similar vision with its students in their final lecture they noted a center of education is soon coming, noting it will teach the student principles and theories of nursing for one year before students go on to gain practical experience in the best hospitals. Both Chautauqua and organized nursing sh shared a vision for another viable option to better educate nurses. It begs the question how Chautauqua and organized nursing may have partnered to realize this idea of providing a standardized theoretical curriculum followed by planned nurse supervised practical training in the hospital setting. Hospitals tight control over nurse training for the exploitation of student work handicap the nurse leaders to consider this innovative option. The context of nursing education and practice during this time was not situated to consider the strengths or opportunities of the correspondence courses, but hindsight reveals that the correspondence course deserves space in the nursing education history narrative for the quality elements of its unconventional pedagogical approach and the supportive educational experience and opportunity it offered some nurses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mathias, um, for your excellent presentation. Um, I loved your slides. Um, we do have some questions over in the chat that I can go ahead and read for you. Um, the first question is from Carolyn Castelli. Um, I apologize if I'm saying anybody's name wrong, um, but Carolyn asks if there's a museum or any building left in Jamestown related to the School of Nursing, and if the reputation of the Chautauqua Institution in Jamestown helped the School of Nursing, and if there were any mental health nursing guidelines in the lectures. 
Okay, so um, the first question is the actual building that I showed in the first slide is still standing. Um, I do have a picture of it today, but I did not include it on this presentation. Um, there is not a museum. Um, the uh, Fenton um, History Center is where some um, of the documents are that I collected and um, looked at. The um, Anne Oboiski spent many, many years, and I wish she was on today, um, collecting um, artifacts. And when she, when I told her that I wanted to continue this work on this school, she took all of her boxes of documents and artifacts to um, the archive in Gilderland, and I was able to look through them before they were processed. And so that's where a lot of the information came from um, for this study. Um, what was the other question? Oh, mental health. Yes, there is a, there is a little bit of mental health nursing um, in the uh, lectures that are intertwined um, through some of the other um, conditions. And there was one more question. Um, if you thought the reputation of the Chautauqua Institution helped the school. Yes. Yeah. And I didn't have time to cover that, but uh, William Bailey, the secretary, was actually the founder of the school. And he had actually, um, he was a publisher and he was also a furniture manufacturer in Jamestown. And he was also um, a photographer. And so he had actually published many books for the Chautauqua Institute and believe that it was very intentional that he put Chautauqua in the name of this nursing school for that reason. So yes, there was a connection. They're about 15 miles apart um, from the Chautauqua Lake where the Institute was and where um, Jamestown, where the administrative office was. Also, another thing about the school is they had a huge uh, fire. And so a large portion of their student records were destroyed in that fire. And so I did not have any records specifically from Chautauqua about the students, just the testimony booklets and the intermittent um, letters that I found in different archives to and from students. Okay, thank you. Um, next question is, were graduates of the school eligible for registration as nurses for those states that No, have <laughs> no, and that was really um, ultimately the demise of this school. Uh, organized nursing in New York took them to court twice, and the second time they decided not to fight and they dissolved the school in 1936. Okay, um, I have some comments. So um, Anne-Marie McAllister wanted to comment that she sees a connection to the development of the community college based associate degree model, which opened the door for a more diverse workforce and a reduction in the number of hospital based programs. And I wanted to ask kind of a related question. Did you know any um, students of color taking advantage of these correspondence courses since they could sort of you know, because they weren't seen, they could kind of, they, they might not necessarily be excluded because of the color of their skin. Correct. So there was no um, admission requirements, um, just pay the money and you get the little extra books lit, booklets. I did not see any individuals um, that were black in the um, testimony booklets. There were a lot of individuals outside that were either um, migrated to this country and then they took the course um, or they were um, having the booklet sent. I did not include this particular fact because it wasn't from the testimony booklets, but in Jamestown in the archive, there was a letter from a family in the 80s, uh, 1980s, where they wrote to um, the history center because they saw that their um, relative had a diploma for Chautauqua and they had no idea what that was. And this came from Africa, um, this family, because they said that she had never come to America. So they didn't understand how she got this diploma from a school in America. And so I'm sure that the reach is much larger than what the testimony booklets um, provided. Okay, um, do you know how graduates were received by private duty nurses who trained at hospital schools in the community? Well, there was some notice of, or some mention of that in the testimonies where students talked about sharing their lecture notes or their lectures with um, hospital trained nurses and that those hospital trained nurses complemented those lectures. And so, 
there is a lot in the nursing history um, narrative that there was a lot of competition between trained and untrained nurses during this time period and that they had difficulty finding work. And this is one of the reasons why organized nursing was trying to protect the title nurse. Um, and so I think the difference for these students is based on their location is why they enrolled in Chautauqua for, uh, for a large part. They're very rural areas. So I think the reason they were able to find more consistent work is because of their geographic location. Thank you. Um, was there any pediatric content in the curriculum? Yes. <laughs> It was part of the obstetrical, and then there was a few mentioned throughout. Um, it's really almost uh, organized by body system, and so they did go across the lifespan in different areas. Okay. Um, did the school prepare their graduates to expect and receive a certain level of remuneration? Well, it was talked about in the um, testimony booklets how much they were going to get paid. And some of the testimony testimonies did give specifics, but there was a, a large variation, again, based on location. So they did, there was also a, like, you know, earn, learn more, earn more type of motto too for the, the Chicago School of Nursing. And so, yeah, that was really the, what was pushing um, how they were advertising so that they could get paid more to become a trained nurse because there were still a lot of untrained nurses during that time. Um, one of our participants asked, um, they said, you, I know that you talked extensively about the positive reviews from students and promotional materials. The students were encouraged to write the physicians with uh, questions and complaints. Were there any physical sources indicating complaints or criticisms? For the most part, there were there were no complaints. It was more of I need I need more help, and then that was that was given. So there was I didn't see any negative where the student was saying that the school wasn't providing them what they needed. There was some confusion with the passage of things in the mail. Um, you know some issues with that happening, but I did not see anything negative. Um, someone else asked if there's a list of graduates in their location. No, again, um, the, because of that fire, uh, a lot of the records, that was about halfway through their tenure, a lot of those records were destroyed and nobody knows where those records are. All right. Um, does anybody else have any questions either that I might have missed in the chat? I know there's, um, Dr. Mathias, several comments here as well. Okay. Um, just thanking you for your presentation. Um, you know, it was really enlightening. And I mean, it's so relevant today, as you said, with, with all of the struggles that we currently have with nursing education and trying to accommodate, um, you know, the restraints due to the pandemic. So we thank you so mm -hmm. much for your presentation. Um, if anybody has any further questions for Dr. Mathias, um, her email is available at the bottom of the screen, um, mathiasa at uncw.edu. Um, oh, I must be 